It's no secret that media outlets are obsessed with a specific portrayal of Japan that they know gets views and therefore ad revenue. But what is often overlooked is that Japanese media outlets have a similar fascination with how foreigners view Japan. I use foreigners because that's the term you'll hear on Japanese TV, like the show Why Did You Come to Japan, which is broadcast to an eager citizenship that can't get enough of how their country is perceived by the world. For the rest of this video though, we're going to replace the term foreigner with what the broadcast actually means. They mean Westerners. It isn't always white people, but it is almost never Asians. Of course, that bias is because not being Asian is assumed to be a giveaway of one's foreignness. But Japan has a history of enjoying how specifically Westerners perceive their culture. I remember how my university history professor hated The Last Samurai because of how inaccurate it was. And I also remember how my professor in Japan loved it because it introduced American audiences to an idealized Japanese culture he was proud of despite the inaccuracies. There wasn't just an American audience living vicariously through Tom Cruise in Japan. There was also a Japanese audience just as grossly enamored with watching a film about a foreigner falling in love with their culture. Upon its release, the film received immediate criticism from American observers that rightly pointed out the stereotypical noble savage and going native tropes typically associated with a white savior film. But that didn't stop it from reaching near the top of the Japanese box office. And it still holds the number 14 spot to this day, having been knocked down by several Japanese films and anime. And although the film was nominated for a plethora of the standard awards, it is notable that one of the only ones it actually received was from the Japan Academy Film Prize. It would appear that Japanese critics and a large enough audience were wholly interested in seeing a white guy go native. Aspire to live my life uh, with integrity, compassion, honor, loyalty. I just, those are things that I think about and that mean something to me. Um, but I definitely, in, in making the picture, I got to really get inside a, a different culture, one that I'm absolutely fascinated by. Bushido provides the best starting point for the phenomenon of Japanese people caring about how they are perceived by Westerners, because the publication that made the word famous globally was originally written in English. While studying in California, Nitobe Inazo wrote the book with the specific purpose of getting American men to respect his home country. It wasn't translated into Japanese until a full nine years later. It became a bestseller in Japan specifically because it was read by prominent figures in the United States. Nitobe had explicitly made sure that Bushido sounded as close to European chivalry as possible. He even directly referenced Greek and Roman culture in the book. The target audience was white men who respected ancient Europe, so therefore its purpose was to connect Japanese culture to something they would understand, even if it meant changing the origin of that piece of Japanese culture. You may also be familiar with Shinto, the traditional religion of Japan. But even Shinto was criticized by Western observers because the practice did not appear to exist prior to industrialization. During the Meiji period, Japan rapidly industrialized in order to catch up to the Western powers, and there was a concerted effort to modernize all aspects of Japan. This meant that spiritual practices, referred to as kami worship, was organized into the religion of Shinto. It's sad to say, but it's more likely than not that Nitobe would view a film like The Last Samurai as the natural extension of why he wrote Bushido in the first place. The purpose was to have Western men respect his home country and to recognize them as a civilized people. And Emperor Meiji himself, as well as most Japanese, were keenly aware of what Westerners did to the peoples they believed to be uncivilized. The Emperor is most interested in your American Indians, if you have fought against them in battle. We have, Your Highness. The Red Man is a brutal adversary. The Emperor wishes to ask Captain Olguin if it is true they wear eagle feathers. 
and paint their faces before going into battle, and that they have no fear. Every culture goes through a convulsing time when the modern replaces you know, the, the ancient. I've always been fascinated with studying martial arts and been fascinated by the romanticism of, of, of the samurai culture. Every moment of transition carries a price, but something ineffable is lost, something ritual, something traditional. There's this tremendous romanticism to that now extinct way of life. Japan's got it in mind to become a, a civilized country. And Mr. Omura here is willing to spend what it takes to hire white experts to train their army. American critics of the film typically likened Captain Algren's military service during the Civil War to another example of the white savior, as it is a common trope most famous from Dances with Wolves and also director Edward Zwick's prior work on Glory. But The Last Samurai only mentions Algren's Civil War service once. Captain Algren's important contribution to the military, and why he is a useful living advertisement for rifles, has no connection to the Civil War. It's the Indian Wars that followed it. I have been hired to help suppress the rebellion of yet another tribal leader. Apparently, this is the only job for which I am suited. It's also why Watanabe's character even admits that his reason for capturing Algren is so that he can learn about his time fighting in the Indian Wars and to understand his enemy the way his enemy understood the Cheyenne. Tell me of your part in this war. Why? I wish to learn. Read a book. I would rather have a good composition. And the source of his excessive drinking throughout the first act is because he can't forgive himself for having his research be used by the military to destroy a culture and people. He's even read your book. Captain Algren's study of the tribes was a crucial factor in our defeat of the Cheyenne. If you learned any Japanese history in your schooling at all, you most likely know that Commodore Matthew Perry forcibly opened Japan to trade with the United States in 1854, while showing the Japanese shogun a model train in order to explain the technology they could receive through trade. He was surprised that they already knew about trains and even more surprised when they were more interested in discussing his previous deployments in the Mexican-American War. The truth is that the Japanese had been learning about the U.S. for almost as long as the U.S. had existed. The Shogun had kept control through isolationism, but they kept themselves up to date the entire time. Following the fall of the Shogun and the rise of Emperor Meiji, White supremacy was already the dominant force in the world with colonization and imperialism. And Japan wanted to avoid being conquered like their neighbors. Scholars within Japan immediately began to draft up publications of where Asians stood in the world. There were publications that conceded that Asians were directly beneath the white race. More dubious publications even went as far as to denounce the cultural connections with China by drawing a direct link to India rather than China through Buddhism. This was done because Northern Indians were a part of the Indo-Aryan ancestry, directly tying the culture of Japan to a people directly tied to the Aryans. I wonder who they were trying to impress with that. And we feel that in a way the affinity that we have for your culture and for that of the samurai is so tremendous, and we hope that uh, that you will look upon this as, as a gift from us, and it's taken in that spirit. And thank you for having us today. Earlier, I said that it appears that Japanese audiences were interested in watching a white guy go native. The poster for the US release only highlighted Tom Cruise, but the Japanese one was of the three leading Japanese talents, Watanabe, Sanada, and Koyuki, alongside Cruise. So audiences had two different interpretations of the film with American critics assuming that the white lead was the main character, while Japanese viewers walked away feeling differently. As University of Hawaii professor Dr. Jason Chun explains in his 2011 publication, films are about the time period in which they are produced, and not about the time period in which they are set. Meiji period began with the US bullying Japan, and although the film portrays the US military training the Japanese instead of the French who did so in reality, 
The comments made between Captain Algren and Watanabe's character do reflect how Japanese and American soldiers interacted with each other 50 years later. The warriors in your country do not kill? They don't cut the heads off defeated kneeling men. By the Pacific War, many Japanese had been raised on the new Nitobe style of Bushido. His publication was written to promote Japanese culture abroad, but now it was abused by militarists to promote unwavering devotion and honor through death on the battlefield. And then they came face to face with an American culture that honored surrender, where admitting defeat is seen as the most respectable decision a leader can do because it saves the lives of their soldiers. Many of our customs seem strange to you, and the same is true of yours. By the premiere of the film, these two powers were allies that shared a history together, and their alliance was by no means an equal one. Japanese people were feeling bullied by the United States once again, just like in the start of the Meiji. President George Bush was dragging his allies into the Iraq War, and Japanese citizens wanted their government to refuse just like the French one did. But the Japanese government capitulated, sending Japanese forces to invade a country for the first time since 1945, because it refused to stand up for itself. Since I was a little kid, I wanted to travel the world, and I wanted to make movies. Yeah. And for me, Mission Impossible was a, was a film that I could go and celebrate a culture and its landscape and have all of this cool, you know, intrigue and action go on within it. Yeah, we'd love to have you do some scenes in Japan. Yeah, <laughs> We're waiting for that. <laughs> You've probably noticed a couple of themes across these unbearably cringy interviews I've been bookending parts with. They aren't just evidence that Japanese culture was successfully consumed by Western men as intended, but even more apparent is how little any of them cared for that culture at all. Over a decade later, Cruz is saying the exact same things for Mission Impossible and scoffing at the idea of filming in Japan. And audiences there still love him. He starred in a film that successfully repackaged and idealized Japan, created to impress Westerners, and sold it back to the Japanese people. As I mentioned earlier, enough Japanese people were willing to spend enough money to lock the film in to the top 15 all time at the box office. What did these audiences see in the film that outside observers didn't? I looked at Yahoo America, and they said that The Last Samurai was the white man Tom Cruise. But I wrote that it was strange for him to be the samurai. The Last Samurai was Watanabe Ken, right? I was shocked at the American opinion. What's surprising about this movie is how even one week after watching a preview screening, scenes from the movie keep playing in my mind and continue to be alive. Moreover, my tears start to pour out when I think of them. Not all of the viewer reviews were full of praise, though, but critical takes such as this one were incredibly rare. One cannot help but feel that the producers exploited the samurai spirit of Japan in order to affirm modern America's national policy. I want you to remember this. Until we lost World War II, about half of Japan truly believed that, quote, I will die for the sake of the emperor. That is, for Japanese, a sad past that should make us feel ashamed. But this critical review shows us precisely the reason why so many viewers were moved to tears by this film. Many Japanese who saw the film were becoming tired of feeling ashamed and wanted to be proud again. This foreign film allowed them to express nationalist views they had been repressing within themselves. I have concluded that the treaty is not in the best interest of my people. If I may, so sorry, but you may not. You can't help but compare him to today's prime minister, who has dispatched the self-defense forces to please the Americans. The combination of critic and audience reviews shows that the film really hit a nerve that had been bothering the average Japanese person at its release. As a nation, they have spent over 150 years trying to be respected by Westerners who couldn't care less. 
and Tom Cruise gave them a fantasy where finally one fictional character took their side. Film allows us to see a world that could have been, rather than what we know was historically accurate. Despite the film being based upon over a century of altered Japanese culture, specifically for Western consumption, director Edward Zwick inadvertently added modern Japanese feelings towards the United States to the Meiji period, allowing Japanese people to ask themselves, what if we stood up for ourselves more? And on top of that, why did it take a foreign film for them to be proud of themselves? We should all teaches us, you know, hard to ourself and kind and considerate to others. We should learn about that yes. from the samurai spirit. And that kind of spirit can help us to make next step into the future. I had a difficult time refuting my professor back when he told me he appreciated this film, because the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this film was the first non-anime portrayal of Japan I had ever seen. I guess Nitobe's Bushido lives on when a product designed for Westerners results in them appreciating Japan. And just like Bushido, it was brought from the US to Japan to fanfare and praise. He also confided in me how concerned he was that his students were becoming more opposed to the idea of Japan being ashamed of its history. They were reading books written by revisionists and believing in an idealized Japan he believed to be too forgiving of their wartime period. The difficulty with Japanese pride is how it's always entangled with shame. And for some, The Last Samurai let them be proud without restraint. And that's how a Hollywood film cashing in on a Japan boom opened up Pandora's box of Japanese nationalism. And it is still open. The new nationalist movement positions itself as liberation from American oppression but it is doing so to avoid engaging with its own history of oppressing its neighbors. And that is a much longer topic for a much longer video. Hey guys, this film is usually used as a throwaway joke, but you really can't dismiss how well received it was by Japanese critics and audiences. So I wanted to get it and its impact on Japan out of the way as soon as possible before moving towards more Japanese films and anime. Hopefully you sat through it all, and as always, if something stood out to you or you think I should have expanded more on a certain aspect, please let me know in the comments below. And if you're new here, please like and subscribe, because there's a lot of context to Japanese media that Western commentary doesn't touch upon, and I want to share my love of Japanese art with you while providing that context.